Bob Wolf of the Wolfden channel recently made a video in which he purports to enjoy playing 2D side-scrolling platformers using keyboard button inputs, which is a shame because I used to respect Mr. Wolf. See, a few years ago at the Too Many Games convention, I saw Mr. Wolf at a gas station or a convenience store, one of those two, I can't remember. And I said, hey, I like your channel. And he said, and I quote, thanks, man. How can you say something totally normal like thanks, man, and then go and play 2D side-scrolling platformers with a keyboard? Well, I'm willing to admit when I'm wrong, and I'm not wrong this time. However, I did recently dig into this whole keyboard thing, and I conducted a very unscientific study regarding click behavior for keyboards versus game pads, and I'd like to talk to you about that right now, if you'll indulge me. This is a little video I like to call, wait, so there actually is a difference between keyboards and game pads other than form factor? Before I go any further, please consider subscribing to this channel. I make weekly-ish videos about video games focusing on usability and gameplay topics sprinkled with a sprinkle of redundant humor. I recently conducted a usability and gameplay analysis of an in-development game called Dungeon in a Bottle. It's a 2D precision platformer and is absolutely delightful. If you like Celeste or Super Meat Boy, put this game on your radar. I have no idea when it's coming out, so put it on your shopping list on your refrigerator now so you don't forget. One focus of my analysis was the menu system. The developer of Very Handsome Games called specific attention to the menu system as something that they'd like for me to take a look at. So I did. I look at things people want me to. It's who I am, okay? It's also why driving down a billboard-filled highway can be dangerous for me and any of my passengers. Billboards are meant to be looked at. I can't help myself. When you've been playing video games with an eye toward usability for as long as I have, you start to intuit things on a, on a gut level without having to rely on a checklist of usability heuristics. In the case of Dungeon in a Bottle, with the menu system, something felt a little bit off. But I couldn't quite articulate, so I kept on with my play session. Later in the game, I noticed that a particular mechanic called the Moth Jump depended on button presses during specific intervals of time that for some reason, perhaps my own ineptitude, I'm willing to admit, I couldn't quite land consistently. Then I remembered old Bobby Wolfington. I think that's his real name, I'm not sure. And his impassioned defense of keyboard buttons as a good input for 2D platformers. Something he said stuck with me, this particular something. A button press is instant and satisfying. There's no room for error here. And it stuck with me so much that I was able to recall it as a basis for further investigation into this menu conundrum. So in regards to my issues with the menu system and my issues with the moth jump, the cause suddenly, much like Bob's keyboard defense rationale, clicked. See, the issue I found with the menu system is that when changing from one menu item to another using a gamepad, it was possible and actually quite common to cycle so quickly through the menu options that landing on a specific option was difficult. I thought about Bob's description of a keyboard button click as instant and satisfying, which he said in comparison to a gamepad input, meaning that by contrast, a gamepad input is less instant and not quite as satisfying. So I had a theory worth testing. Are gamepad button presses less instant than keyboard button presses as Bob's experience shows? Do players tend to hold gamepad button presses longer than keyboard button presses for the same objective? Well, first, I wanted to better understand Dungeon in a Bottle's own playtesting measures. I reached out to the developer and asked him to validate a hunch that I had that the game's testing so far had been focused on keyboard input and validate that he did. Proof that I'm a usability god capable of reading the player like a cow reads a storm. Like how an old man's knee can just feel the change in air pressure. I can feel that a game hasn't been tested using a gamepad. I'm a usability savant. This is when there's supposed to be Gift from Heaven music playing. Oh, there we go, a little late, that's okay. Still works. But knee pain or groups of cows in a pasture aren't enough to ask a development studio to allocate resources to addressing an issue. I needed data. So I mocked up a menu system to test this theory. I used a menu system both because that's the situation that initially churned my gut, but also because it's a testing environment that eliminates skill-based variables. I needed to remove as many variables as I could because I don't have access to a fancy lab with lots of eager test participants. No, I have access to just this room with a fancy red chair, albeit, uh, and just three uh, participants, also known as less than eager family members. Thanks, family. So, I have the test environment, I have the testers, 
and with a quick script to count frames during button presses, I have my data stream. Each session went like this. I had the player sit in front of the screen. I then instructed them to pick up the controller. I told them that the D-pad should be used for this test. I wasn't testing how intuitive the interface was after all. I was testing for frame counts, so I felt comfortable directly telling the player how to navigate the menu. I then gave them a simple set of instructions to follow. For example, uh, go down to the exit option. Now go up to the color option. Now back down to the exit option. And on and on and on until the player had pressed an average of 28 buttons. I then had them do the same for the keyboard. Afterwards, I had some data. Average frame counts are higher for button presses. Yay! And this average is consistent even at the individual participant level. I even had to remove one outlier of 50 frames because my youngest kid tried to hold the gamepad down in hopes of cycling through uninterrupted. <laughs> what a clever kid that is. I wonder where he gets it. His mom, probably, probably. Sure, this data isn't enough to be scientifically valuable, but it's definitely enough to add some credence to this idea that gamepad directional buttons tended to be pressed for longer durations than keyboard arrow keys. Practically speaking, how, how is this useful? Well, first, and perhaps most importantly, it means Bob's thoughts about the instant and satisfying nature of keyboard button presses is valid from a slightly more than just a subjective perspective. Second, it means that any coding in the game that relies on specific button states may need to take this input-based player behavior into account. Now, I have not talked with Very Handsome Games specifically about how they coded the game, so from here on out, I'm relying on hypotheticals that could be hypothetically applied to any hypothetical game. Hypothetically speaking, of course. First, note that there are three states that a button can be in. In Game Maker Studio 2, the engine I'm most familiar with, these button states are check pressed, which checks to see if the button has been pressed, check which checks to see if the button is currently down, and check released, which checks to see if the button has been released. If cycling through the menu is based on the check function, then knowing that gamepad users hold buttons longer means that those players may inadvertently cycle past the desired option. Perhaps replacing this with the check pressed function would be better as this would allow the menu selection to advance only once per button press. However, for games with very long menus, this would force the player to press a button many times instead of just holding a button, which would be awful. I mean, think the way Contra on the NES is way less problematic when using a turbo button. And by less problematic, I mean easier for me. And that's less problematic for all of us, really, right? My use case is everyone's use case. Okay, that's not a usability rule. It should be. So in this long menu scenario, the check pressed function is probably the right way to go, but some additional logic might be called for. You know, perhaps the developer would want to incorporate a timer of sorts to allow the selection to advance only after a set number of frames has passed. According to the lowest frame count capture for a gamepad in my study, that number would be five frames. The developer could also have these rules be separate for gamepad and keyboard users if they really wanted to cater to specific gaming habits. Now, overall, I'm really happy with this finding. Again, it's not scientifically valuable, but it is incredibly interesting, to, to me at least, as it further helps me understand the differences between gamepad and keyboard inputs. Too often I think of the two interfaces as entirely preference-based. I don't think of them often enough as different in terms of functionality, at least not with games that are limited to very few simple mechanics and a few button requirements. If you are interested in watching my usability and gameplay analysis presentations, I've got a link to those below. And if you are such a nerd, we should we should be best friends. I mean, you know, give me a call, right? Uh, let's let's dish about the people we have crushes on while we eat ice cream in our pajamas during sleepovers on school nights. You know, friend stuff. I'm curious if any of you play 2D side-scrolling platformers with a keyboard. Have you always done so? Or was there a time when you, like me, thought of it as incredibly strange? Have there been any games that you started playing with either a keyboard or a gamepad and then switched in the middle of that play session because of either input methods or limitations? You know, what were those limitations? I'm really, really curious to know. And please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon to make sure you don't miss future videos. If you're still watching this video, you obviously got something out of it right, so it only makes sense to subscribe. That would be the rational, reasonable thing to do. And while you're at it, maybe check out another one of my videos. There, there's a couple over there on the side that you can pick from. Uh, those are randomly generated, I think. So hopefully they align with the type of content you want if the algorithms are working. And if they're not, complain to Philip YouTube, the YouTube head of YouTube.